Oh, the same way now we sit down and we watch the sideline copy of a fucking tape during practice. Can you imagine that shit? I mean, it's like watching Atari sometimes. But uh, Pat's coaching the tight ends with the San Francisco 49ers, which is a great organization. And he's going to talk about uh, the tackle of the tight end on the front side of off tackle plays and outside plays, and how different techniques and, and different drills he uses to, to block the front side of those two plays. Pat Morris, San Francisco 49ers. how it's grown to a larger crowd and people still coming and staying here all day. It was, I think, a group of five guys. We didn't get paid. We just came here and talked. And this thing has grown since then. That's 1987. So uh, it, it's really good that you guys come here. It's, it's not just all line play. It's, I think, it's just football and techniques. And it's, it's good because I think it, it's everybody learns from everyone. Just because, you know, there's a lot of guys here with 20 years experience to say the league. You know, this is my first year in after college. And you learn from everybody. Don't you, I don't believe at any time, think that it's because some guys in the NFL, some guys in college, oh, I'm in high school on Division three. I think we're all in the same boat. I make matter of fact, I know we're all in the same boat. And we all can learn from everybody. I can learn from you. You can learn from the next guy. Don't ever, I don't think, put a degree of, oh, he's up there, he's in the league. And I, I, I work with a, a bunch of guys that have been back and forth with in the NFL, and they would talk kind of down to you saying, you know, well, this is what they do on Sundays. And I said, well, wait a fucking minute. They do great things on Friday afternoon. They do great coaches, great coaches on Friday nights. There's some good coaching going on Saturday. Yes, and there's good coaching going on Sunday. And, and every time I, you know, I heard that and that was said to me, I, I said to myself, I am never going to be that type of person and say, now that I've arrived, I've got all the goddamn answers, you know, and it's, and it's something that I think coaching, we can help each other, help each other out. No matter what level you are, free, come free to talk to me. I should feel free to come talk to you and create that, that camaraderie and just to try to get better at any techniques. You know, I, I think that uh, that is the key important as long as you keep on getting better. As soon as you reach the day that you think you know everything, I say you're in trouble and you're probably going to get your ass fired. All right? <clears throat> so basically, here's my background, and I've kind of, I can't say probably if I have an original thought. In, in line coaching, because everything probably was done way, way before. I think I'm kind of what you would call an eclectic coach. I pick things up from everybody that I've talked to, things I've experienced when I was a player at USC to my graduate assistant days all the way through. I picked up little things and I, I guess I just believed in those and they work for me and they stick with them. And if all of a sudden something comes up that I think might be a little bit better, I might change it. And then I might change and say, hey, that was the wrong thing and I'd have to go back to the old way. But at least you're always trying to get yourself better. I started out as a uh, as an offensive uh, offensive guard at USC. Coach there was John McKay, and then Dave Levy was a coach there. I was influenced by those two men. <clears throat> then I went as a graduate assistant. I was underneath Hudson Howe, who's now everybody knows him with the Dallas Cowboys. And then uh, John Robinson was the head coach at that time. Then I got a job in Northern Arizona with Joe Salem. Got influenced by that man a little bit in terms of offense. Went to Minnesota, replaced a great coach, Roger French was there before I was there, Roger French. Kind of looked what his guys were doing, kind of picked some ideas up from Roger French at the University of Minnesota. Came back to USC with Ted Toler as an offensive line coach. Then I went from USC, four years, for 83, got fired. I went to Michigan State for eight years under George Prost. Replaced the great line coach, Buck Nystrom, everybody who knows him. And saw some of his players. One of his players back here was Pat Shermer, who I coach. He's now coached at Stanford. Then, after Michigan State, went to Stanford with Tyrone Willingham. Right. At that time, Monty Clark was the coach at Stanford. Right. Saw what his kids did there, so you learn from that. And then, obviously, now I'm at the San Francisco 49ers, and I'm with probably one of the, uh, you can kind of say, the different type of style of coaches. And Bob McKendrick's been there for 19 years. You see him, he's got the bald head, old marine sitting in there like that. But he is probably the most genuine, 
man I've ever met in my life. You'd think I'd come in here one year, he'd look down, hey, 19 years, hey, you little punk from college, you can, you know, just go work on the basic cross and fucking forget about everything else. He is taking me, told me the things that he's shown, he's back from Tommy Pro things in the same one, and it's probably one of the unique line coaches I've ever been worked with, and has allowed me to come in, work with the tackles, be a line coach, and, and help with him, and he, I'm gonna show some of the things he has, because he was, he's almost opposite of the stuff I've learned at USC. He's on the other end of the continuum. And I think that some of the stuff he has in the 49ers and athletic, athleticism with the offensive line is something that you guys will be, uh, it's something different, you look at it, and if you like it, you'll like it. Because basically, he'd rather have guys not big, not heavy mass, be the smaller guys, be athletic, and because uh, he his premise is athleticism, you have a chance to always have recoverability. If you're big and you're heavy, when you miss, you miss and you got no other chance. Right? If you're athletic, you can still be able to recover if you miss somebody, you're athletic enough to recover, come back, and maybe get a nick on the guy and have a chance for a play. And it all starts basically with um, the Crawler Slippers, I'm going to get into a little bit later. He works at Crawler Slip to death, and I'll go through the kind of the, the drills with that before I get into the, the combination. <clears throat> One thing about I have to tell you, there's one thing about coaching tight ends after being an offensive line coach for 20 years in a, in a college is that there's nobody else in the room. There's only four guys. Now, you know, usually you're trying to talk to this guy, you're trying to give this guy shit, you try to get on this guy. There's only three guys in there. After you got the first three guys, 20 minutes is done. And you don't have enough time to go. I felt lonely in there. You know, there's only fucking three guys in there. And so I was trying to find a way to buy time. You got to take breaks all the time because you go over everything and there's not enough guys there. So I, that was the biggest transition for me to sit there with only three guys and you used to have an 18 in there. You know, and that gets long. Uh, sitting there watching installation sometimes gets a little boring because they like, they get animated, they get up here and they've got the overlay and they're doing their files and doing all this stuff. You know, I'm used to just sitting there in that room looking out protection with the guys. So it's kind of, it's a different transition, but Bob has helped me enough to be close enough to the line that it's not like I'm in a, in a, in a different world. Um, the thing we'll talk about here is, is the, the, the Crowder sled. And probably what the Crowder sled we use basically to, to develop the resistance. As soon as resistance happens in a block, the number key thing in blocking a guy is how fast the feet move. Right, how quick you can get the feet moving and staying low. Right? I think we've seen this in many ways to teach the drive block or work on his blocking techniques. You've seen the shoots in the boards. I've used those. You've seen uh, just going ahead and hitting the one man down or hitting the seven man sled. Right? The crawler, I believe, and I believe this, it has the ability to work all facets of the lower body. Right? It works the whole lower body in the sense of getting the hips through, the feet start moving, and you get a decent resistance. You can't find that, you know, you always, you always coach the guy with a bag or the guy on the other side of the line more than you are trying to coach your offensive line. Hold the bag, get more resistance, give things. Because everything we talk about is being engaged. What happens after you're engaged? All right? Anybody can block the bag. And the guys in the, in the pros are worse bag holders than the guys in college. They could care less about holding the bag. So if you can't scrimmage, you can't do a nine on seven, you gotta find some way to give yourself some resistance. So basically what Bob believes in, and I think he's got a great point here, is he'll work the crowder at least 10 to 15 minutes a day. And it's various drills, so you kind of get away from the boredom. But it's a basic thing of it keeps you low, it gives you the idea of getting your hips coming through, all right, and be able to get the feet moving faster after contact. To me, that's the key. Get moving after contact. Now, it's a stationary target. It's not slanted movement, but don't be out of That shouldn't be a big concern of your ears. It's just the fact of just getting to practice. And he believes all the time, I think, he I believe he's correct, and I'm correct, is that it will just get you in a habit, like we're always trying to create habits with drills, that you will stay low. If anything, it keeps you low, and you can see the guys that are not knee benders cannot do it very well. So I think starting from high school, you can use it, and you can go all the way up, and obviously we use it in the, in the, in the pros. And the biggest thing I think it's advantage is, is you know, you talk about it, we talk about the West Coast offense, this and that, you know. The key, I think, to that whole offense, I don't believe it's the patterns, I don't believe it's, you know, it, it, it's so much the scheme. It's the fact is the way they practice. 
We know not where full gear that often at all. Probably the first four games, after the first four games of the season, they might be off for the rest of the season. So how do you get the guys better? The crowder is a machine or an apparatus that you're able to use without any equipment on it and get some resistance to get the guy to work. Now you can wear a helmet, sometimes you don't have to need a helmet, but you know, you advise to wear the helmet on it. But it is something you can use because we don't go live against each other, you don't want to beat each other up, but the crawler is a device you can use without pads on. Because that's the only thing you have. You've got 20 minutes of individual. I think there's a lot of, there's no transfer when you block back. Right? You need to get the resistance. The only thing I ever, one of the things I learned from being a kinesiology major was part hole transfer. Right? You've got to try to make, the only way part hole transfer has any transfer in a task is that that part has to be as similar as it possibly can be to the actual task that you're going to perform. That makes sense with that kind of jargon. There. But it, you know, I think, you come, so if the, the part does not have anything, any similarity to the task, it's transfer will never happen. You're just practicing the week 20 minutes till you get the team. And I believe when you don't have any pads on, that this, this, this product can at least get you working on what's going to actually happen in the game with some good contact because you're not going in. That is the key, I believe, in this West Coast system, is they know how to practice without pads on. And in college, they're limiting your rules to wear pads in spring practice in the fall. And I guess, you know, when you get down to that preseason, you know, you play a lot of games, your team gets banged up. You've got to learn how to practice without gear on. And I think all this thing all ties in together. And you need, as a line coach, to try to find a way to practice without equipment on, and how to get you guys better. I think this, this machine is, is not the cure-all, but it's something you can incorporate in your drills. And I, I'll show you some, some quick ones here. The whole progression we really don't use, and it's on the crowd of people have that on. Bob and I did a film out in our, in our facility that has everything you can do on the crowd. They just got a little promotional tape. So I got some of the clips off that. I can't do the whole thing because then the guy will get mad at us because I showed it here and he got duped up and he doesn't make any money. But I think it's like 18, 19 bucks. I don't know what it is. So get that. That has every drill. But most of the drills that we use will be in my films here and I'll go film. I'll just do some of the basics here. Then I'll start getting into how we teach the progression and the drive and the, the tackle and the tight end. So let me look at this real quick here for you. On this shit, there's all kinds of apparatus, guys. Two hands and face. There are times where the flipper is used 
in some of our blocking techniques. But basically, if you could take the picture, have the camera, and not even look, and go from the waist down, that's kind of what you're looking at in this drill. Is basically, uh, don't worry about the, the flipper. We'll talk about the flipper later. This drill here is a work on the flipper. We use it a lot in some combination blocks, and we use it uh, maybe on some cutoffs. Right? But there's, there's part of the progression that's just working on the flipper technique. Right? This is basically here, just the forearm coming against the pad. It's just to, to prevent or get a feel for it, not throwing, rolling the shoulder. And getting the good bend easy, just coming here, getting the feel of the shoulder girdle coming up in this fashion. All right? Now, again, like I said, you can say, oh, man, we don't block that way anymore. Disregard that. The key to this whole, when you get back there, is going to be from the waist down. Because the bottom line is you block people with your feet. All right? So if you don't believe, say, hey, I don't believe in this, this form stuff, we don't use a flipper. But there are blocks. We talked about it. There are blocks where this flipper, you can jack somebody, and it's effective. So just, you know, if you say well, we don't do that, just take a look at this and then you'll see it in some of the, the cut-ups that we have. So okay, this is Ray Brown, he just tried to stump. You can see that the, uh, the wrist is right here, the wrist is kind of limp, and you just, boom, just give it a shot to the back. Same square knees back. Outside hand is free. Alright, now we're just going, boom, with the flip. Uh, this is Joe Rudolph, so that know is a Phil W. the Wisconsin guy, but it's just the flip. You can see the hips come in and delivering the blow of the flipper. Now, if you remember back the way Jim talked about a hit and a strain, uh, Bob doesn't teach that, but I think that has a little method to it all. But the thing you're looking here is he's getting his hips into a little bit with top of hips and you flip it up. And the, the motion is up through the man, not a turn. You got to see if you, know, you don't want him to turn too much on a little quick flip. This would be, as they go in, would be a technique a tackle would use somewhat on a double team on the power play. And you'll see it being used. You can use that flipper there a little bit. Or a tight end on an outside slip would use this technique with the flipper to get the tenant. I always call it jack the guy up. Boom, jack. All right. Now yeah, this is the, the explosion where you could be six point, we have six point, this could be the four point, just boom, get the hips through. Now you want to come up, here's the old technique, now Howard's back there, Howard, you got there? He's probably talking. In the old days, this was Bobby Kitchen, that was Howard pushing the guy in. There's a tape way back down the same angle, doing this exact same drill. Howard, Howard was still losing his hair back then, and you can see his Bob was down here. And that's, that's where he went to bed and end up. And what you're trying to do is get the athlete, the young man, if it's high school anyway, is get the feeling of getting his hips through the block. Get him through and extend through the man. Boom. A lot of, a lot of people call it marry the pad, whatever you want to call it. You get that extension. Just explode. Boom. There's the flipper we talked about. The shoulder is square and you get the hips through. Now, when someone does this, the sled should move a little bit. I'll talk about loading the sled up because there's an art to making sure in different conditions how heavy the sled is. You need some sandbags on it. Sometimes you know it all depends on the weather and what kind of grass you have out here. But basically, if your sled's moving too flat to get this drill here, you can stand on it if you want to, to get that extension, if it's moving too quickly. But you basically want to get this feeling right there. We've got to load up with some good, good enough sandbags. Boom, explode. Notice the outside arm is thrusting up. You've heard already Bob talk about the free arm. This exactly, you're back the exact same thing, the free arm, keep that outside hand out of there, extend it through. But you can see the explosion there. Coming off the knees and exploding, getting the fill of the hips through. He should just hang there. They want to all of a sudden, and if you hit the ground, hit it with your stomach. Don't also put the left hand down. A lot of guys are afraid to fall down, don't put that left hand up. Extend it. If the, if the sled just goes out there, you should just belly flop right on the stomach. Should belly flop on the sun. Now, there are a couple more in that sequence of the explosion with the hips. There's a long stride one. There's just in a stance and just extending out through that. You'll see that on the crowded tape. We very rarely get into those. That would be kind of the, the beginning, the fundamentals. If I was in high school, I'd probably do the whole drills all the way through to get the guys feel for it. Then, because you don't have a lot of time to build things. Then, this is the one we use the most. 
It's basically just hip from the pad. Now, your location of the pad is key because those crawler, that's why right, the crawler has a little angle to it. So you gotta make sure you hit it on the correct angle. Then if you hit it on the correct angle, you can find out if he's fading one side or the other, is the feet are getting too narrow, or is, is he chesting it, all the things that can happen. I'll go over these a little bit. You can find out what's, what's he doing wrong with it. But basically what you're trying to do here is get into the sled and feet move. Making contact, get resistance, and feet move. Now, let's talk about this now I have here, loading up the bag. These are just sandbags, but it's, it's plastic around it. So if it rains, the sandbag doesn't split out and the sand goes all over the place. Right, it's got to be plastic. And you want to place them in the middle of the, of the shield. So if you put it here, it's wrong. If you put it on the back, it'll go too far up. It'll just come up too high. So you want to kind of have it central in the middle. If it was really moving a lot, we would put a big dummy. You'll see sometimes a big dummy from here to there. to put a little weight on Just one of those big pop-ups. You can put it there for a little extra weight. But the weight should be in the middle of the shield. Now, what happens if, if it's sliding too easily and there's not a lot of resistance, that's when you gotta put more weight on it. Right? And it's not like it's a you know big scientific act to find out how much weight, you just put more weight on it, and then you give them some resistance. You just need it to move a little bit, but you don't want it to be so much that they can't move it at all. And you don't want it to make it so easy. And the toughest is probably a wet morning. Usually if it's real wet outside, you probably won't do it until the afternoon, or you load it up. But you can see, now, if you're worried about the footwork right now, no, you just want to say, get into the bag and get your feet moving. You can work the individual footwork of a reach, a cutoff or initial step, a cell step or a bucket step. I think you can you conform that to what you teach in your first step. But right now, we're just trying to get into the bag, hit. Notice when he hits it, he should have about eight inches. That's about how much pad should be shown left. That's the key there. Make sure that should be what should be shown there. And you can see the lift. All right, now, here, it should be about two to three inches. The front of that crawler should be off the ground. You can see, once you hit it, that spring forces you back down. That spring, see that spring right here, forces you down? It's going to get pushed you back up. This, to me, I think, is the key to the whole thing. When, I think it was uh, Jacksonville uh, Mason. <laughs> talked about last clinic. He talked about his drive progression where you're coming down the line and then you come up and you gotta get back down, right? Try to get your hips back in the block. This is exactly what's happening here. And this where I think is when that spring shoots you back down, that spring shoots you back down, you gotta get back up. Right there, see it's flat, get the hips back in with it. And you can see how fast his feet are moving. It's one of the better guys at it. You see where you're So it's hip, get stable, keep low. Now this is a low, he stay low, get the feet moving. And the whole thing we're looking at is how good is this hip move? Okay, spring knock him down, get it back over here. That I think is one of the key elements, the fact that if you continue to do that, that's, a, that's true to what you see on the film and just a true run block. I mean, now you can kind of get the alignment. So you kind of have to get aligned with that angle there. Basically your chin's probably right on the edge there. You know, when we did the flipper technique, that shin's kind of just outside to work the flipper. You got to be in this position all the time while things are going to spin. You see, get into it. There's how low you are. He gets it up. The spring comes out up. Great job. See, he kept it. The guys that are really good at it, the spring doesn't knock them back down because your feet are easier. If your feet, if you're flat back, that thing over the shield will go right flat back down and just slide straight ahead. You can see that's how, and that's what usually happened when Golden first got on this who's not a style that, that Bob likes, he can never get this thing off. He either chest it, which we'll see later, or he's driving it with a flat back beside his knees bent. But it's that hip, boom, feet. Now you say, well, aren't his feet a little close together? Yeah, you can maybe say maybe you just separated, but again, what you're trying to work on is hips and feet moving fast. All right? You'd like to have them maybe a little bit further apart, but just get them working, the exposure with the hips. Now, this is kind of the wrong way to do it. This is what I thought about going. You get too flat, the pan is flat, right? And you're just working against yourself. Let me go back to it. Again, you always like here when you drive it, work in that outside arm and pumping it like you're running. Like you're running. I was like, always watch it. A lot of guys have a tendency to grab that pad. 
because it's like a security back that used to hit with their hands. Just hey, you want to see the, the the hips and the feet do all the work. Don't hold it with the hands. You got the foot. You don't want it. Get that hand out of there and pump. All right. Here's a classic chest lift. Obviously, you can see he's too high. Remember, we said we want to see about that, <clears throat> about that eight inches of that pad showing. All right. Now this is what you call chest lift. And that's what's going to happen. Now you've got too much there. It's not two inches. It's about six or seven inches underneath there. All right? So now he's just chest lit, and that's going to be a problem. Now you just way too hot. All right? That's a classic thing of guys who call it chest in the pad. You just, your flipper comes up, but you just chest it. You don't work your hips through. And if you're aligned wrong, you'll get that thing spinning like that. All right? Make sure guys are aligned better. I think Mac, you had the, you know, you had one guy that, that had a trouble. Some some guys just don't freaking align right. You said, hey, you're right here, and they, they got to do it. You see, hey, they don't understand the angle. Have you had some guy climb up all the time? They start spinning up. <clears throat> now, I want you just to pay attention because this is going to come into into play here. It's, and, and Bob and I, when we talk about this, it is hard to simulate the contact, other than do it live, the contact on a combination block and for the guy to get contact, resistance, and come off on something. How do you do it? Do you do it holding the bag? You try to hold the bag, the guy the bag, and just goes back. And it, it's unrealistic. To me, there's no transfer of learning. So you're trying to get, you're making the contact and you're coming off some type of a combination. We use this drill here, and it, it can be a multitude thing. Picture this guy right now, this is being a tackle, I'm gonna get it later, on the double team on the power play. All right, boom, flipper, high ends coming in here, boom, coming off for somebody. All right, coming off for linebacker. Now, we've even gone a step further. We've taken this guy and lined him up here and shot him to simulate the initial run through. And when that guy runs through, you still make a contact with the end, we'll go ahead and just run through, and now you gotta try to come off resistance and be a good athlete and come, come off and look like that linebacker come underneath. Okay, we'll get that a little later. But you can work, this could be a, a you know, scoop, slip, double team, anything of coming off contact resistance and coming off to somebody. All right, now, this is just coming, running at a guy, coming out of the linebacker. Now some people like to come off this way and gather your feet when you hit a linebacker. But this drill is just being able to keep you low, I believe, when you're trying to come off and block a linebacker. Too many guys stand up, so you just got a little separation, hit, explode, same technique, comes off, keep it up there. Now, you can really see if a guy's feet fall through, hips come through, is the athletic, if as soon as that spring starts to shoot him down there, he keeps it up. Keeps it at two feet. The front of the pad never hits it. The front of the shield never hits the ground. He keeps on driving with his feet. I mean, this is probably, this guy's probably in the advanced category, but you'll see him later. But he's getting the boom, working it, and keeping the feet moving. After contact. This is, so you're practicing just in space. Pull it and trap it. All right, here's a classic of chest in it, boom, thing goes down. Then he, but he, hey, that happens, but he kept up fighting, regroup, got the two inches left. It's a nice day out there that day. It's been raining for so many times in San Francisco. 140 days straight. Maybe instead of calling the West Coast offense, we'll call it the El Nino offense now. <laughs> now, here's a classic. That's the stuff. This is called the knee drop. Drop to a knee and explode through. Now, geez, we don't block anybody blocking too deep. This is showing your flexibility in your hips, your ability to be, get low and be an athlete and come up and strike somebody. It happens sometimes. You get down in that position, you crunch down, can you get yourself up and continue and stay on your feet? Boom, knee drop, explode, in comes the spring, try to knock you down, stay two inches up, keep the feet moving right. You just take a sack guy, here's Ray Brown doing it. You want to drop the knee that's closest to the pad. Don't go on the outside pad because you hit that one and you take start spinning on it. Stay in the angle. The knee drops should come to right there. It's just that the, the, the knee touches the ground. Now you're just showing explode. Boom. And keep it dry. 
I mean, that, you know, and there is great problems. So you can't just say lighter guy is great problems over a 300 pound guy that's got his great athlete, boom. You can see the flexibility of the hip, <laughs> rise the sweat. And yet, as you see, it was getting heavy. We had different grass. We took one of the, the, she, the, the sandbags off because we just slide too much. I mean, we were too heavy there that day. It also can act as a. Um, <coughs> Endurance, you know, to get fatigued, you can work it for some conditioning even, working the quadriceps, work some conditioning out of it. But again, you, you, there is some boredom in it, so you want to say about 10 minutes to 15, change up the drills a little bit, just don't hit the one drive, but mix it up a little bit, and I think you'll find eventually, over time, don't, don't think it's going to occur the, the very next day, over time, you'll be able to see you guys stay low and work the feet in contact, and it's something you can do as a line coach when you don't have full gear on. You can, we hit this with, with shoulder pads on too now, both ways, but it's something you can do on those days where you're trying to scramble around and, and you don't have anything to do. It's good to work the drive block. The fundamentals that we all know, I think everybody in this room knows the fundamentals of the drive block, is to get the hips through and get the feet moving when it happens after contact. Get that thing to happen right there. Okay, get the lights on here real quick and I'll come back to this. <coughs> Everybody get their prescription for Viagra? I got mine the other day. Took it last night. Got caught in my throat. I got a stiff neck. God damn it. <laughs> All right. My dad's 83 years old. I told him, but dad, you just had a, it's kind of, it, it, it become an age when you're out in California. I'm happy because my, my parents are, you know, getting older and in the early 80s. My dad's 83. My mother's got, uh, just got Alzheimer's. But my dad's 83. I called him and said, hey, dad, you see that Viagra stuff? He goes, you know what? I might take it and give it a shot. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think anything that keeps those, your parents and the, you, you got to always, always see your parents. To keep them happy, to keep them alive, I think it's the best thing since so nice. But here's a guy, 83, and he's still got a little, Chances, maybe I'll take myself and give myself a little jump here. <laughs> uh, All right. Okay, I'm going to go here real quick because I got some film here. Is basically with the tight end. We'll, we'll talk. You can. Uh, we'll talk about tight end now, and then I'll talk about the two combinations that are on this tape. Is basically just working the drive block and the reach, drive the reach, and then we'll call it the double team and the slip with the <clears throat> and the angle block. Let's use the tight end. Now on the on the drive, basically now you're seeing, you know, either what we would call a 25 front, it's just an under with the buck there, and you're seeing a ton of because people think tight ends can block. Basically any type of that or the bucks that side where you've got a end on it, either in a seven and a nine or playing a head-up technique. Basically now most of the the buck backers. We could out. You say, what the hell is a buck? Right? In the West Coast system and their defense, that guy who's been Sam all my life for 21 years now becomes a buck. So when you hear me say buck, I hope I can say Sam for you guys because that, that's, that's the way they call him. They call him buck. Why? You just don't, you're not supposed to ask. Right? <clears throat> anyway, they play now on a straight drive buck since most of the force is we see it, a ton of force is usually lightning, or we call it thunder, lightning, thunder, coming from inside out. The buck is usually playing extremely wide on it. At best, the tightest he gets is his inside foot to your outside foot. So basically a drive block and a buck back and buck back is basically easy using a basic, the basic premise, you step with the near foot, we talk about you step with the near foot. Now, I've always wanted to do this, Jeff. Because I haven't been up here, we didn't have the stage the first year. But you get that sound. I mean, just you know, why because of you do it, just accentuates it, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled right now, I can play funny stuff like that, and it's on tape. <laughs> Remember you used to be in here, like that all the time? I like that. It's good. So anyway, <laughs> get back to it. And it only lasts about two seconds, I feel good about that thing. Anyway. <laughs> basically, on a buck back, we'll drive back, and basically on our draws, it's just you step with the near foot, 
You just basically put your hat right down the middle of the guy and stretch him, push and drive, and just stretch him as that's all. It's pretty simple, all right? Pretty simple. Very rarely will that guy cross shade you from that white line. Some, so you, you see him once in a while, but I still think he can recover with that first lead step. It's not really a drop, it's kind of just a lead step we use that with a tight end, because tight ends don't have a lot of strength, I think, with drop step. We just lead step out, get your head in there, and then drive him. Now, outside backers are pretty good at getting their hands inside if they're coached more. So a lot of times when you come out there, you try to get your hands inside, but your hands get outside. Big thing we try to work is replace the hands and get them back underneath. Replace the hands and get them back underneath. Because there are times that you can't shoot your hands, the outside backers are standing up, they're looking at you, their eyes on you, they get their hands underneath it a lot. They get them inside. So talk about after contact, replace the hands and put them back underneath. If the guy were to come back inside on a slant, hopefully you could just be a good enough after you cover and put him inside. I think that happened more time than When you're driving him, right, just take him where he wants to go. Take him where he wants to go. If he wants to fall back inside, just work your feet, just take him inside. I follow him. If he wants to turn outside, fine. If he wants to just play it and just turn outside like that, go ahead and just turn and take him and stretch the hole. The guy that's the toughest buck on the drive block is the, I call it the Matador. It would be uh, Wayne Simmons, the Romanowski, uh, Seth Joyner. When they come out at you, they kind of play the soft, they kind of matter. They let you come in here and then they do the old matador and throw you down. And you tell your tight end guy, I try to move the guy off the ball, but yet all of a sudden this guy soft on me and just flings me. It doesn't matter to him. If you know that guy's that technique all the time and usually they're one or the other, you come off with a little bit more of a settle, a, a control step, pick it up, and you definitely want to get, which I, when I get from Mac, here's how come I collected, you get it from a little different people, is kind of get yourself in the duck, and he's trying to move you like this. I got a great one on film. You keep the knees bent, you kind of walk them off. It prevents, come, back, come off a little bit more in a duck walk on guys that are the matador type. Right? And take him where he wants to go. Because he's not delivering a blow on you. He wants you to come off with all your gusto and you're tying your bottom up and give you a little, little torridor shot. Okay? And I think that, that's the key one. Notice what, if you can, if when you scout, find out what kind of guys do that. There's a class of bunch of guys that do it and that we played, and there was those three we mentioned. Romanowski loves to do that. He sits there, you know? And if nothing really changes, I think Bob G, a lot of guys want to tilt. The, the buck backer now on the tight end, tilt them in there. I think the reason for it, they don't do it much when you got a near back, but they do it when they, they can come in here and they think they can see things better, right? Nothing really changes, but that's how Romanowski, he'll sit in there like this, and he loves the, the Matador technique from that position. But if the guy is tilted at us, we don't change a thing. Just treat it like he's there, nothing's different. Take the lead step, put your head down the middle, and drive him off and replace the hand. And hopefully your hips are working just like we talked about in the crowd. Against a defensive end, and, you sh and we should win the matchup against the Buck Pack. We had a rookie tight end, even in, 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 in Brent Jones, we had a rookie tight end when he was 250. He can block most Buck Packers, we believe, with some move. When you get the big defensive end on you, now you've got a little different thing. A lot of people, talking to, to uh, <coughs> Paul Boudreau, he says their tight end don't want to do it. Doesn't want to block the defensive end. All right? Well, if he doesn't want to do it, you got no chance of teaching him, so you might as well do a lot of arc releasing and types of things in combo with him, because if he's not going to do it, he doesn't feel like he's going to do it, then, then forget about it. <clears throat> if it's, we would treat that just like a drive block. If it's a seven technique and a straight drive block, he's inside, we would settle with the inside foot. Same thing near foot. Now, this settle step came from Anthony Munoz at USC. Hudson Hawk and I were making a training tape on the drive block, and we were always talking about subtle step with the back foot, don't overstride. It was always a subtle. <laughs> now, how did that happen? I didn't even do it with that. Mushroom shirt. <laughs> you can get it outside. Put this in there. See that? You did it on purpose, boss. So we get the mushroom sale. 
Now you think Why do you think they call it fucking mushrooms, right, huh? So I'll give you one of these. Do you think I can wear that in San Francisco? Every drug dealer in America coming, hey, you got some? <laughs> Where are you going? Are you from are you from Humboldt? You got some good stuff? Look, it's green is hardly perfect. You probably have a good track to <laughs> Alright, where were we? You okay for that? Go, go, keep going. Okay, we're good. Uh, <clears throat> so, I go back to the subtle step happened. We're, we're doing the the uh, drug, drug walk, teaching the dry block. We always talked about the second, the, the first step can be a short step on the dry block to be able to pick up the slam. <laughs> then we watch the film of dry block of Anthony Munoz, and Munoz. Being in his left hand and stand, right hand and stance, picked his front foot up and drove off the guy and picked up every slant in the book. So as we had it printed up, and then Hudson, we walked the tape, and Hudson said, Pat, I think we should go back and change the wording in that book and say that a first step with the up foot is okay. And it was a, just a pick it up and put it down to be able to drive block and pick up any slant. So you would step on the drive block with a tight end on an end or even a tackle. This is a tackle. If it's an inside shade technique or head up, the first step is always to pick it up and put it down with the up foot. And that's how the subtle step from USC came. And I learned that. And I, I've kept that since the days of we, when we did that at USC. It's called just a subtle on the drive. If a guy is head up or inside, or you think he's, even if he's in a Outside chain, you think he's a guy that's going to slap? Go ahead and step with the inside foot. All right, you can still stay square. You say, well, God, do you lose a little power there? Yeah, you sacrifice a little power, but you got the ability to pick up the movement, and it's okay to have a standstill for a moment. Say the guy does a slam. Well, you're going to have a standstill for a moment. Don't worry about it. He's got to come off the block one way or the other. So basically, we'll step with the inside foot. Hands inside, I think I don't want to bore you guys with you know, all the hand placements, but it's a cell step with the inside foot, hit him and out. With a tight end, you're going to get a stalemate. He is not going to drive most of those guys off the ball unless he's got great leverage and he can move a guy. Usually that guy weighs 270, 280, he weighs 250, unless you got a 270 tight end. All right? There's going to be a moment of stalemate. That's why we're talking about keep your feet moving, keep your feet moving, and then as soon as he wants to come off the block, you come alive, push him, and take him. So the finish is the key there. So you got the approach with your steps. I think we all know kind of everybody's working on the approach. You got the contact, and then you've got <coughs> the finish. All right? All right? Approach, contact, and finish. And the finish is the key with the tight end because it's going to be a standstill there. And don't try to torque them one way or the other. I think last night, uh, Tom Robot talked about that. You may be able to torque in some against some people, but if you start torquing these big guys, you're going to get thrown down the ground. Stay square and let them go one way or the other. Soon or later, he's going to make the play. Hopefully, just one hand in there is not going to stop the back owner. Stay square on it. And you know, you not don't expect to get moving right away. Sometimes you say, you see Courtney, God, can't get him off the ball. I said, don't you understand how much that guy weighs compared to this guy weighs? It's going to take a while. As soon as he comes off, now you can use his momentum. I right, once the Something's in motion, it stays in motion until the block before it stops it. Huh? That's the old physics. That's not a bad one, but that's true. Once he starts moving, it's easy for you to take him and drive him. So basically, in all those techniques, you step with the up foot. If he's inside or head up, and usually if it's a nine or wider, we go ahead and step with the outside foot. If you get a real wide technique on the drive, a wide technique on the drive, I'm kind of telling you guys of all the different people I really that I learned this from Howard, is the old T-factor. Howard talked about the T-factor of just opening up and just trapping the guy, because usually when you drive block the guy. Same thing could happen when you reach block that technique. You open up and you just go ahead, you can't reach him, you just, and you T-factor just end up trapping him. T-factor comes from, sort of Howard, World War II, when they had the guns, the guns in the front, let the ships come by and go, boom, you had better target. Right, Lance? Right. So that is the T-factor routine on a wide technique that's coming up. Now, something came up here. It was a rookie mistake. We're playing Carolina. Who's that, Lathan? Who's he got? He was out wide, but he was pointed towards him. He says, oh, I thought that was a T-factor. He goes like this, and boom, he gets goddamn blown up. I said, when he's pointed at you, it's just like a regular drive block, just like the buck stand at you, you got to have to take the step and lead right out. 
So T factor only happens when you know that guy's coming up the field, then you gotta take it up that way and get out of your hand. Okay? Alright, now <clears throat> let's go with reach. Versus the buck. And then versus the end. Versus the buck. As wide as they're playing now, very rarely can you get the true reach or hook and get the play outside because all the forces come up. That guy is usually taking off in this run. His job, and I think you understand for the time, is understand what the buck's spot is. Buck knows he's got support in the side. His job is if I can string you out, keep my leverage outside, I know I shouldn't get like this because now I can never make a play inside. They will probably touch, string you down the line to gap you, and when you see the ball come inside, throw you and come back in and make the play. That's basically how they teach our buck linebacker, right? So basically when you reach that technique, you try your aiming point is the outside press plate. This is, you know, talking Jim, we take a, take a drop step, get on the angle, get your hat on the outside pad. If for some reason you happen to beat him off the ball and you have the reach, stay with him, work him on a 45 degree angle, and you got him pinned inside. If he does normally what he's doing, Bob, can you go up here? Or something? I get it. I've always wanted to demonstrate up here too. So it's, we're here and we're here. Oh, now we're here. Now, the thing we want to do, now I just turn it into a drive block in my mind. I just got to say, hey, the reach is off. He's got his position. He reacted away. I just turn it into a drive block and do the best I can, flap him down the line of scrimmage. If he wants to turn and go off, beautiful. Now I know he can't make the play, and I stretch as much as I can, stretch as much as I can to help out my tackle, because usually my tackle's got to reach inside, or we've got to block down. So basically, it's here, try to get your head here, boom. Now just take it, and you just work your feet just like you're working a crowder, it turns into a drive. If for chance, you beat him off the ball, boom, now you've got it. Now just stay on that course this way. If you start talking and turning, he's got your head. If you can get the edge, go ahead. Don't take it. When you start talking, what happens is the hips turn in too. And away you go. Stay on it. I'll guarantee you that guy's going to come with you. And you stay and you stay right on the line with him and stay on that 45 minute. They always have a habit to think that means to turn back in on. Stay on course. He'll come to you. Now he'll say, oh shit, I'm reached. Come fast. Boom. Then you turn. We call it turn and fling him. Boom. And run him out. Everybody good on that. We very rarely see guys that we can truly reach and hook, unless the guy uses bad technique. Okay, versus the end, which is what they do a lot. Now that's the tricky one. Now you got all these techniques. I'll go quick with the feet, and I think the film shows a little bit better. Seven technique. All right, the classic example is, oh, I got this easy reach, this is easy as hell. I go here, boom, boom, the guy gets penetration, knocks the guard off, everybody looks in trouble. If the ball is handed off from the far back or in the eye and it's a bounce play, not a toss, toss is different. Toss, I think, you can still step on the outside foot. Everybody understand if the ball's like in the far back coming across the formation or a bounce play inside, you have to step on the inside foot first to stop the penetration. Now, what's going to happen in your head, it has to be right on the inside pad. When this guy sees some pulling action, a lot of times he likes to come back out of it, right? You just have to do the best you can if you can secure, secure this position, you've got it. If he runs so fast it goes out, just turn it like a buck, turn it around and we'll run the play inside. Because usually when you're running out of the eye of a bounce play, if he chases out, you shoot it, you go right down, so he can't be right. Kind of, I like, kind of like the guy going out there like that. So make sure you always step with the inside foot first, first, that hands are moving, you just go ahead and clap. So it's almost like a drive block. But we're thinking that, hey, you know where the ball's going, it's going inside, and bounce now. We're going to talk about this play later, hand off solid. Think everybody going to be running. If he gets cut up, all right, now we'll go back and we'll still, we'll step with the outside foot first, first here, go the second step right up, the, right up the gut. I think we all know that, that's been talking this play for a long time. If it's a nine technique, you should be able to reach him in a tight end's mind, it's an attack line, the same idea as a buck linebacker out there. So take a little more depth, cross it on the angle, try to get you out here, and stretch him. If you hook him, he should be in the game. Next play, he'll probably, he'll probably take him out on the night technique. Any hand. Huh? Any hand. 
inside. inside. Except if, it, if it's even if, it, but if it's inside and he's in a nine, we still will step on the outside foot. Outside foot. Now, if it's a toss, no matter where he's lined up, I think he can, he, he can secure with the outside foot and pin him in. Because usually we're pulling the balls declared outside right now. You can have outside footwork all the time. So the key probably point there, if you kind of set your mind, is if you're coming across a formation or inside, step with the inside foot. If you think of any penetration on the reach, step with the inside foot first. Even if a guy is head up, but if you see somebody come on the outside, go ahead and step with the inside foot first. Protect your inside first. You can always react back up. The worst thing that can happen is the old classic overreach, and this guy messes everything up with a bounce play or with a play coming across the formation. Okay. Any questions on that? I gotta get the film and probably visualize it a little bit better. Okay. Now we'll talk about what we call B block, people call it text block. And you can get that. You say, well, that's the same block. Let's put it, put that in a little bit in here on the five. Where he's down, he's pulling, you're down. When you're texting it, you have two techniques. We call it one would be the angle. When I know my tackle's pulling, chances are that the, the, he's giving it away, number one. Hope you don't tell him. He's, the defense fans can usually read that he's doing it. Or he sees the action go out, this guy, most of the percentages are, he's clubbing across. Guaranteed. Unless for some reason in your stance, you see he's got too much weight on his front hand, he's leaning forward, it looks like a penetrator. Right? If he looks like he's just reading a normal five, he's clubbing across. Our aiming point is the near hip. You settle step with the inside foot, you aim right at the near hip. I guarantee you that hip will come right towards you, and you put your hat right on is, is the closest number, just on the path. That's why I would call it an angle, right? Because you're assuming that he's going to club across. If you don't know, if you watch that film or you haven't seen it, if you have any doubt in your mind of what's happening there, we'll go ahead and say, okay, do the power angle. Stop penetration. Take, take, get, get your foot open, slap, get your head across, and if he clubs across, do the best you can to react back. Now, we've had many discussions at this clinic well, what if I don't know he's a penetrator? What if I don't know he's a club? Now comes the good stuff. It's the reverse shoulder block. Now, some of you guys at Clark High School, you can't do it, but we'll show it. I'm going to demonstrate it here. It's the old, you call it reverse shoulder because you can't say light work. <laughs> this is the block that got Bob McKittrick chased up the tunnel at the Coliseum by Howie Long because he was frustrated. A reverse shoulder is you take there's a pickup step right here with this foot up and down, and you try to hit, you get the head across, you probably make contact right with the zero hole, and you just foot swing your legs right around and you land like a cat on the ground. It's easy to describe here. It's tough to practice, you just practice against a bear. You gotta do it live and, and engage. But we call it the reverse shoulder. And the classic line is, and, and, and it's by Bob, he says, well, God, you're on the ground, you're going to that guy's knees. He says, well, because tackles do it when they do the angle block. We don't know. He goes, it's a classic line. He tells us, well, you know, either that guy has had surgery or he knows someone that just did it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and I said, he says, hey, they, they'll think about their legs when they do that. Just, you're not trying to be brutal. It's a legal block. You can back. It's just that when you're down there, he's, he knows someone that had surgery or he just had it. I, and make them think about it. And so if there's a, if on this angle block, on the, on this technique, usually we stay with up because he's crushing. We can tell what they're doing. If you don't know, if you want to stop penetration and a clubber, the reverse shoulder is the only answer I have. Only answer I have to stop both the penetrator and the guy clubbing over the top. And I'll guarantee you guys, it drives defensive line coaches crazy. Because how they practice it, they don't know how to practice it. And you'll see it here. They try to jump over it, try to do anything. So the reverse shoulder can be used by a tackle on an angle block. It can be used by the tight end on his angle block. When you have a this block, we would call that B, because anybody can call it whatever you want to. And this, this thing, when the tackle's down and you're down, 
this reaction by that guy is different. Because when the tackle comes down, now he's thinking, oh, it's going to be traffic. He's more of a penetrator now. So in your mind, you're tied in, need to know, is it an A block or a B block? Is my tackle blocking down? Is it a double T down? Robe. He needs to have that communication so he knows how either the five technique reacts or the seven's going to react. There, if it's down, down, it's a flat angle. Now we just, just like I talked before, get the head in front, go ahead and just drive him down. You're not trying to take him over. If he happens to come back out, do the best you can to come get him. We probably got a guard pulling him and cleaning him up. But penetration is a thing you're trying to stop. So that would be a power angle step. So there's an angle, there's a power angle, and then <coughs> reverse shoulder. Three ways to get that block accomplished. So I've covered the reach, the dry, and the angle. Now we'll just go with a couple combinations here and we'll look at the film. The, we talked about this last night, the infamous double team on the power play. Since I've been watching the tapes of this clinic, Jim and everybody likes you take it off the inside foot. More to, sometimes, right? I mean, the first time we came to this clinic, it was in, take it off the inside foot because it kind of collapses the end. They think it's the play, he kind of collapsed. You get a little bit more movement because you took it off the inside foot. It looks like a cutoff. It looks like old Bob cutoff stuff. It looks like the slip. That was an issue. Well, then now, you guys are coming hard up the field. If you come inside, you don't get enough oomph on the end. Or your tight end isn't very good, isn't, doesn't have much strength, and you need more help from the tackle to get movement. All right? Hannah Finn, when he was here, talked about stepping with the outside foot, boom, and flipping hard to get the good push. All right? Point made, that's very good. Harris Barton did that all the time because he had Brent Jones here, and Brent Jones wasn't a very good, powerful guy. Well, now we've got Stratford, so I guess we've taken it a step further. Stratford, we gave Stratford up, he can do whatever he plays to do with his first steps, based on alignment, based on game plan. If he feels that that guy is wide, go ahead and take outside footwork on a double team for the lead man. If he's tight and he think he may slant or may come inside, go ahead and use inside footwork. And they say, God, he's doing two things one time. It works. He gets a feel for it. The key is that tackle always has to have his eyes in the inside gap. He's got to have his eyes in there. The whole theory about the inside foot work first, kind of put your eyes in there all the time. When you step with the inside foot, your eyes kind of fall a little bit. You can still have your eyes inside when you, when you, when you come here with the outside foot. And, get the, and this is where we use kind of the flipper in there. Get a good flipper. Tight end is just what, what we talk about. It's kind of like the slip. He just takes kind of a lateral step. We want to get moving. The key to this thing is we want to get movement that way. Vertical movement up the field. Get it going up. Knock the guy off the ball and declare Mike to run underneath. If you knock him off the ball, there's no place for the first guy to go. Knock his ass underneath. Right? If anything happens here, still keep your eyes inside because you have any run through, not just the whip back there, you could have somebody clubbing over the top. Right? You could have somebody missing a block. It could be anything coming into that gap on that power play. Anything. All right? If it's real wide in, don't go out to him. Just stay in your pass. Take him. Just take your outside step. If he's there or not, go ahead. Tiny can take him. And then stay on your inside path. Never would we take this and go way out here and then come back up. It might be just a little bit just to get in there, but we trust our tight end can hang on that block a long time. If you had a problem with the tight end holding up there, I'd probably use the old power release. Release him outside and put the fullback on. <coughs> so basically, the tight end forward is kind of, he's trying to get his failure point. It's just that pad, trying to push and take that guy over, push him straight back. Maybe if the tackle can take him over and get him. Very rarely does a tight end ever come back on anybody over the top. I think Jim mentions that. Let him make him over the top. Don't be in a hurry to come off some guy over the top. The key is the movement of the end off the ball. If this guy disappears, I think we all know he works himself up to the second level. Now, there's a question. What if that guy kind of scrapes real kind of tight but not real tight? We usually, when that guy flashes at you, we prefer you not to take him because you know you got the guard pulling around. <laughs> But if for some reason in Tampa Bay, who runs that fire zone bubble blitz, 
when a guy is on the ass and he comes off the tackle, he can't do anything but go ahead and hit him. Let me know what I'm talking about there. There's two different types of scrape. There's kind of a flow scrape that's tight, and there's the one that comes right at you right now. If it comes right at you on your path, go ahead and take it. Don't come off your path and try to go block the first back. Work yourself back and go ahead and get the bubble back and come over the top. Now, when we run this play, maybe we will try to, because we don't say it's a, it's a slam for number two or the number two back. We sometimes will take a shot there or pull this guy around for the whip. So it gives them a thought that they can hang on the double team just a tick longer. Now, obviously, you can't stay in the double team because we're getting a lot of shot inside there. There's some classic examples of we push you guys so far back. Mike says, screw it. I'm not going to the top. I'm going to try running eight. Tackle comes off, and we have a decent play. He goes against Philadelphia. He did a pretty good job of that. But, so I think the key is the footwork of the tackle is just be athletic enough when you get in a thing to be able to come off eyes and then to come off on the guy quick. Don't bury your eyes into the, the down end. You've got to get your eyes in the gap to see what's happening and get a good hard flipper. And it's, it's truly exactly what you do on the crosser side. Is it? That, that's exactly similar to what we're doing right there. That's basically what we have on the slam. We call it slam watch, just that double team. I'm trying to think. If the tight end sees somebody go over the top, sometime at the last minute we tell them come off, boom, and just cut somebody. Again, it's having resistance, working on resistance, feet moving, and be able to throw on somebody. I have a block somebody. I think when in doubt, we tell the tight end, stay on that end, drive them like you would normally drive them if you were to have them by yourself, because you can lose your tackle at any time. The classic is the tight end coming down here, thinking he's got the tackle, tackle comes off in a run through, and the end comes right through. The tight end can't fall asleep. Assume that you're going to lose your tackle at any time, so you've got to take over that block. And you cannot be at this angle here because the guy will split you. You got to take a lateral step here. It's, you know, it's not truly lateral, but it's getting yourself square so you can take the guy straight off the wall. All right, again, I'll go to the, the, the film and we'll get some questions later. Then the next front side one, I think I don't want to get too detailed with it, would be just your front side slip between tackle and tight end on a bounce play or anything like that. Tight end is not a lead man. He treats it just like he would if he didn't have any help on a wide nine technique. He goes ahead because part of the percentage are the nine's going to stretch and the tackle's going to come underneath. If you get the head up technique, you're the lead man in the combination block, you go ahead and settle. Now, no matter what happens, doesn't matter what the play is, I can use outside footwork because I'm protected inside. Remember we talked about the reach when I have by myself, when we're blocking down and pull the guard. I have to step with the inside foot when I have a play coming from far away of a tank. If I've got help from my tackle, I've got a slip coming with my tackle, I can go ahead and use outside footwork, second step comes up, boom, the flipper. Flipper, jack this son of a bitch up, stay with him until you feel your tackle push you. We talked about it last night, everybody knows like the zone scheme we talked about, and just stay on that block. Remember. If that guy fights with you, you can lose your tackle at all times, tight end. Don't think that you're on, you don't want to get this shoulder in there, but stay in contact with your squeeze him because you may lose your tackle on a run through. The tackle's technique is exactly the same as a guard would want on a slip technique. We do exactly that. We, we can gain more ground because we're uncovered, eyes are on here, we get a feel for it, boom, and just slip it. Now again, since we're coming downhill, it happens a little quicker than, say, the way we run a slip for an outside zone. Because remember, our run play is either coming from far across or it's dipping and coming out. So it's not as deep as a drop step as you may want. It may be just a short here and get yourself in. We did not do that, this technique, that much. We're going to do it more this year because we believe we got two tight ends now that can probably work that technique. Earl Smith and this great man, Greg Clark, who working from Stanford. Because you want to run it to the bubble. If you want to run a certain way, we like to run this play to 68, 69 head up to that side if we possibly could and execute the slip and zone scheme. We did not do that as much. We did it a few times this year, but not as many as we'll probably do this year with the two tight end set. All right, now let's try to look at this stuff here now on, uh, on film.
I drive. I can go ahead and use a drive. I use the shoots once in a while, just work against a butt backer. Step with the inside foot, boom, hands inside. And just drive it. Hands down inside. Just a little throw. I don't use a board because you're kind of on an angle, but again, it's something you can use when you have pads on. I think this is a drill that's similar to what we do. You get pads on, you get a contact. I try to get this guy to shoot his hands in there. Again, you don't want to be coaching the guy on defense too much. Right? And that's the problem. Hopefully, in this drill, you get the guy to give a good look, and we're driving. Is that the left end? Hmm? Is that the left end? Or it would be a stand up buck. Right? That's your tight ends on the left side. Yes. They're not blocking down. Not no, this is a straight drive block. Okay. <clears throat> left, left tight end. All right, here's now. I think if you can get with your linebacker coach and do as much as you want, because this is about as good as it gets. I mean, you can practice all that stuff in the shoots. Get on the linebackers or the line, right? Just leave one on, right? This is a straight block. Subtle step, move, drive down the middle. All right. Work the hands underneath, right? There's no ball carry there. It kind of gets like all-star wrestling, but you get a feel for it. Driving, work the hands back underneath, then work, 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 keep on driving. I think he gets something out of that. Right? He gets something out of that because it's good resistance. It's going against a good guy. There's no running back, but that's basically how this guy's going to play it. And you're happy not to get down the center line. It's living on the side. Whistle blows you okay, all right? Here it is right here. We do this block probably on what we call the drop. It's like a box to run. I had the guy turn outside. This work. This is Brent Jones. This is probably the only. Why do you think he's on this? <laughs> <laughs> but now he does a decent job on this play because he's going against the block. You'll see big thing here is a step, and he's working his hands to replace his hands underneath. See the hand that you can't keep out of the back and see it. His left hand right there works back on me. Replace the hand. Replace the hand. This play that's a draw, you don't know where it's going to go. It may bounce outside, so do the best you can. Take him where he wants to go, and the back's got to go where he wants to go. I hear it here against the Cowboys. 25 look. That's about as tight as we see a guy. Right down the middle. Hopefully I can see part of his face now. Now, the guy sees the ball coming on that agent side, work the hand on the knees, come alive. I like this part here, be a dick. Finish, finish the line. I mean, you could give up right there. You could say, hey, I'm okay. But he's right there, there's appearance. Try to push, stay alive. All right, now, here is Wayne Simmons. He is a classic Matador guy. You'll see we'll come a little bit more under control. And see Simmons trying to trying to jerk it there? That's the just a classic duck block. His feet are getting tight. <clears throat> Can't do it. Alright? And now you've got a block. Now he's picking a side. Staying after. Alright? Don't take those guys up. They kind of treat tight ends like saying, hey, you shouldn't be blocking. Alright? One thing you're gonna be is gonna be tough, alright? Alright, be a dick. <clears throat> a little shot right there, this little bitch, alright? Get after you guys there. When you're a tight end, they expect you to block like a tackle and run like a wide receiver. Well, we'll make sure that you try to do the best you can to block like a goddamn tackle. The best thing that's happened probably in Bob since said this, with our success this year running the ball, the 49ers, was number one, the addition of Garrison Hurst. Sorry, Bob, but you got a good one anyway, so let's make it. The addition of Garrison Hurst to our offense and also the ability that we've got a blocking tight end. Right? They can still run the routes if we want to in the passing game. But the, the blocking tight end and the tailback can improve your running games, especially in any type of ball. Alright, now, here's how not to do it. Here's Seth Joyner. Now he comes off, this is his first snap of the game, comes off, got pulled down. He did it right the first time, but again, he came he off the second time and bumps this guy's better. But this is a matador technique we're talking about that you can't have happen. You can't be in the ground and him be ready to make the play. You'll see here, he's upright, his knees aren't bent. He's leaning into him, straight up in the air, and just gets pulled down. That's the thing you've got to avoid on the matador technique. <laughs> All right, now, this drill, I think, is the best drill, and this, I think, Howard showed me this. I think we had it here, too. Mac needs a little bit. Is, here is kind of the finish. After that stalemate, you had, 
when you come off the ball on a drive block. You got the stalemate. So this guy's trying to get resistance. This guy's in the fit position, working his feet in place. He's trying to make resist, resist. Now I say, the command is I go, drive. That means try to work him off the ball. He starts working off the ball, then this guy, immediately he's gotta make a move, right or left, boom. As soon as he makes that move, right or left, you push your hands, boom, and just push him away. Boom, turn and chase him. And you get him to come out. That happens a lot. This is exactly what happens, you'll see it here shortly, it's exactly what happens in the game. When he something happens, this guy makes a move either there, or he just hangs his hand out there, or he makes a move outside. The key to this whole drill is that guy right there. Make sure he resists, that the guy's got to push him. So you, you tie it, you've got to tell your, your linemen, the tackles can do this too, guards can do it, is make sure you're trying to work him off the ball like it's a drive block. Come on, come on and see the best team. Do the best team have nothing, they come and maintain and stay calm. All right, work in the drive block again, I told you, go ahead and work. Seven technique, boom, hit it. Chest in. I put this on there. Too high, we want to see more of the pad there. But it's the same idea, you're working the drive block on the seven technique, take that inside step, boom, hit flip, hit the feet moving. His feet are driving, but he's chesting it too much. See, see if that's getting, when he chests it, that's the only one inch off the ground. If he's doing it right, it should be about two. All right, up top. All right, here's our play, 16 power. Here's what we're talking about. Now, this is kind of brutal. We take a shot here, and the rub is going for this backside guy here. Now, talk about this play real quick. If we have what we call a 49 defense, three linebacks inside, bar nine will say, buck, tells him, hey, I'm bucking it. Fullback has him, the rub or the double team will come all the way back to here, and the guard pulling around has that guy. If the Mike linebacker was back here, all right, and there was a force guy out there, our call would be the fullback sees it says JR. That means Jerry Rice, you don't block that guy, I'm going to go block him. And the slam would go for the Mike back. So it's two different ways versus a over or versus a 49. But the same thing inside, because you always want the double team to last a little bit longer. All right, here's exactly the drill we talked about that I just did. Here's the contact. He runs outside, turn it back. I can see from the end zone, Garrison was new on this play, was a little too fast. You see the hole right here. And that's why, you know, if he's too far ahead of that guard, and a lot of people run this play out of the eye, where I believe they see that a lot easier than coming across the formation. But as you can see here, inside foot, <coughs> drive him, here he comes outside. Because he sees this right here. Outside, boom, turn to take him. That's exactly the drill that I just worked out with the resistance. Everybody agree? That's what I'm talking about, your part hole transfer and drills. Is it actually happen? Is it actually relate? Can you get better at it? Because of how it happens in the game. If you're doing a drill and you don't see it out in the field, I think you're wasting your time. There's no transfer. What you're doing is just waiting for the T period to come up. Now we get kind of a high low here with this guy coming off the slam. But that ball should have hit right there. Again, Garrison had, had, we would say for Garrison on this play, have a little bit more patience before you shoot it up there. All right, now, this is just head up. Got a two gap in here, settle with the up foot. Working the hands underneath. Sometimes the hands don't get there. Best you can. Another way to do it, you do it on a crawler too. I like the crawler on this. This is, to me, Brent Jones, this is a classic why I always step, I don't like the over stride here. If you knew the guy wasn't going to slam and you knew he was just going to stay there, yeah, you can go ahead and step with the outside foot. But I would prefer stepping with the inside foot. He, that was just going to happen. The reason I have this on there for is the perfect position with the head and the hands inside. For perfect, the uh, perfect triangle, I call it. Head and hands inside and drive. All right, right here, here's the same play again. All right, drive block, head up. Stay with him, stay with him, drive him. Now we hit the hole. Now, if you want to get this play here, anytime we get the reduction of the strong side, we like to let the backside guard know, hey, seven, which tells the backside guard, hey, 
you turn up to the hole. That's where you want Ray Brown to go. He may help on that. Right? We talked about that last night. Uh, if there's something short, maybe the guard can blow up and help that tie in on seven. But when it's a straight head technique, he just sits there and drives it. Again, here's that look I was talking about. We'll go ahead and put this to the 49B. He's out on the buck. The double team's coming back here. He's kind of flirted. He should have taken the shot at this guy. What he's doing there, that little curly here is something there. He was doing the position. That's not something he teaches him. But looking at the tight end, he makes a contact, stalemate. Keep working, keep working. There goes the hand there. Finish it. Get your five yard. Here's a head up technique that plays inside. Just keep fighting for it, right? Plays inside. Now, if you, you assume the guard goes there, if he really flattens, now there's a situation a lot of people say, well, why don't we just tell the guard to go outside all the time? If the tight end, he's going to have to think, can collapse that guy from inside, then we'll take it all the way outside. Pull back something here. Right here, guard comes around and ends up blocking him, trying to get the slam coming through. Now, here's a classic flipper run through. Gogan's way too high. He's looking at all the people we got. The guy that's been there the least amount of days is the guy that probably plays the highest. And I think that's it. That's, a, that's a, a classic example of working the crowder and staying low. He's only been there a year and kind of resistant, kind of the thing he does. He's been in the league all the time. But it's a classic example. Everybody's low except the one guy that was there. We do it, we're shifting, just drive block, head up, settle with the up foot, drive, he comes inside, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it, finish it. Again, up top, stalemate, to stay in driving. If he wants to sit there and stick on us like Velcro, stay with it, inside foot, he kind of comes back up. Stay with him, stay with him, stay with him, stay with him, stay with him. Again, this look, seven call. Guard's thinking in there. Again, we found out it's easier to see that there, I believe, than it is coming from all the way across in red. All right, here again is this just a drive block here against a stand up buck. Take him in. Right? Now that's a rookie fellow doing the drive block. I think he's doing a pretty good job for a guy coming out of college and just doing a good job of blocking any type of hands and just stand still. But he's staying low and he can even be lower. I'm thinking next year he'll be even lower than he, than he ever has been. I don't know. I have to reach. You like that little touch there? Long needs to get bold though. You think, see all that brain, that's El Nino effect on the helmet. I don't agree. This is just a little drill we work, just trying to stretch, replace hands, doing against each other. It's kind of something you got to do with all pads to try to get a fill of stretching, but you prefer to go against the defense. I'll give it to you again. Go against the defense. I mean, that's kind of a warm up here to try to get it going. All right? One, two, three, hit it. Now, here's that situation I was on the stage with Bob. He got a tendency, you, you beat the guy off the ball, and do I talk him? I said, no, stay on the angle. Get your feet, you know, his feet are kind of screwed up, but stay in the angle, he'll come to you and take him off the ball. That shows pretty good athleticism. You say, we've got his feet are kind of cross over. That stuff happens once in a while. But he, he, what he didn't do, I'm young man, don't talk him, because this guy's got to do that. And now you've got your stretch you want. Left side, all right, you come, you punch with the hands, boom, stay with him. If he wants to come underneath, you got it. Like to have those hands a little bit lower, but we didn't give him any holy calls as long as they were inside. Boom. Settle. One, two, three. There's a hat. Lower. It's at the bonus. Stay with it. Talk. There's a turn. Take it. Boom. Take him outside. All right. We're up top. Wide buck back. Take him. Stretch him. Don't let the effect of the play. We take the play way back inside. I'll talk about it later. But at least he's staying after it. You try to stretch this guy, drive him to the side. 
Very rarely can we get the true reach. Look how wide that guy is, right? Not going to get it. So drop step, try to get the hat outside. Stay with him, keep him flat, open up the hole right there. We'll talk about this running play later. Here's Seth Joyner. He tries El Torto from outside. Boom, try it. I prefer him to stay with that inside leverage and not get his hat outside so you don't give him a chance to come off and make the play. Again, there's your force in there. Boom, turn. You got with the turn. Turn and take him. Get the shoot up. Get the ball up here. We'll talk about that coming a little later. Just the guy stretching, just staying with him. <coughs> create the hole inside, create that separation. Very rarely do you ever get the hook outside. The true classic get outside. There's a guy, I have this in there because it's a guy tilted towards you. I had a different look. Nothing changed. Get your head up. Ball from here is too hot. To me right now, it's you know it's kind of later season. The thing is you gotta make sure. Still hit that crawler, hit something to keep the guys low late in the year. Because we're getting tired, you're, 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 you're practicing a lot without pads on, you got to reinforce the back to stay low. I looked at the film probably later in the year, I saw us get a little bit touch higher and higher. And I, I, I believe it's because I didn't do as much crowd of drills as I should have to keep those guys low. Alright, real quick, here's a reach. Alright, how to reach, inside step, back. Alright? Again, I don't do those back goes by the back goes are only good for the initial thing. Right, here's a reach block on the end. Inside foot. Now, this is the second time we play Carolina. This guy's a behemoth. He probably is 25. <laughs> Boom. Secure the position. Just stay with him, stay with him, stay with him, stay with him. We should get the ball outside. Looking from the end zone better. Alright, seven technique. Alright, ball's coming here, so he's got to protect inside. There's that foot stepping because it's the dominoes in here and bounce. Hats on the outside, he doesn't do anything. Stay with him, replace that hand on me, stay with him. One inch of lever leverage equals 10 pounds. That's up on top of the board in the room. All right, here is the seven that when you step inside, goes outside. Didn't stay inside like that guy. Inside, it comes back out. Inside, come back up. Now this is long footwork. I'm just kind of showing you the reaction. All right, this was different. We said it was a toss here. But that's how you want to take it. He comes across, take him here. Don't look at that footwork here. I'm trying to show him the drill of the guy coming over the top. Again, I prefer to go live against our defensive end. Here's the classic here. Here's a seven that comes back outside. This is the play we're talking about, 98 handoff solid. It comes forward, it dips. He sevens in there. He sees the tackle pull. Seven technique. Call him back outside, just turn and take him that way. All right, you can't reach him. He see, as soon as he sees this, he's coming across. So just turn and take him that way. Ball come out of here. Work in the six, straight up, we work outside forward, guy head up, you can feel it, work outside forward and take him back. See, I don't think he, other than the first step here, I don't think I get shit out of this drill, because these guys don't hold back with the band. Outside footwork first, this is better. <coughs> work with the defensive end, don't do it. All right, sometimes you're afraid to go with it against the stand, so go ahead, outside footwork, hands inside, that's the reach right there. The guy was head up and just went to our inside. Outside football. Here it is up top. <coughs> Gonna take it. Head up technique, outside footwork. Guy doesn't react, so we got good position. Stay with the shot. <coughs> Here, outside footwork, comes inside. Pin. Backside here, head up, outside forward. Don't slant that much. If you thought this guy was a slanter, you may go ahead and step with that foot first. All right, technique there that slants inside. Do the best you can to pick him up. Outside forward and a slant. 
All right, it's a tough mistake. Now, hopefully you can sniff it out because you see that guy up there. Sometimes you can sniff it out, sometimes you can't. But you got outside footwork, oh my God, the guy slides inside, boom, take you. Be an athlete, just step and pin him in. Outside footwork, slam, pin. You see that I'll talk about this way again, that's like coming across the formation. Nine technique, do the best you can to get you out of here and stretch it. Outside footwork, boom, hit him, stretch it. Ball come inside. Can't get the reach there, very rarely you get it. So work, stay, I guess I did. Like we're talking about, you take your cell step, you make your hit, it's not a reach anymore, man, it's just a drive block. It's just the drive block and things that's out of it. Alright, that outside technique nine come across your face. It happens, it's a tough thing, do the best you can. Hopefully you can step it out as best you can to come in and nick the guy. He loses his feet here, but do as good as you can. It happens. You go here, oh, go. Do the best you can to nick him, and hopefully we can get ourselves outside. If you knew it was going to happen a lot, I, I'd say he could have stepped that out. That's not a normal line. You can see the guy tighten down. If that's the case here, I tighten down, I wouldn't overreach it as much. Or you can settle with the inside foot. Right there, it kind of pulls it down, but I think do the best you can. Y technique coming up, we talked about T factor. <coughs> Open up, kick out. Here it is up top. Guy come up the field, boom. Open up, hit him, stay with him, stay with him, stay with him. Bear. Get a little excited about it. Guy, he did this, he hurt his ribs. When he did this thing, he hurt him even more and had to pull him out of the game. So don't get that excited, we collapse it. Open up. Now you kind of fall steps underneath him. I'd like to open up, but the idea of T factor is there. And bear. Talk about his B. Talk about the B block step into the near hip. If he clubs across, boom, turn and take him where he wants to go. Remember the aim point here is near hip. And sometimes it's even the near hip coming towards you. Maybe even a little bit higher than that. But guess you got to really come across. Prefer to do it against our own people. Be an athlete and work the guy back up. Under control. Here it is up top of the game. Boom, tap a pole, and he knows with a tap a pole that most likely he's going to come over the top. Settle, boom, stay with it. Stay with it. Stay with it. All right? What happens if you're angle blocking and the guy slants down inside? Do the best you can to keep on your feet and nickel. Hopefully you get some memory. I, I don't have an answer for that. You, hopefully the tackle can sniff that out, these are words, and say, hey, we can't be blocking. Let's go ahead and nine it. But I don't know if he could have done that there. He looks like he's in a pretty five technique. We said, hey, we're going to do it all the time. Now the guy does this. Do as best job you can just to try to nickel. And sometimes that works. Other than that, you prefer there to have a man call. <laughs> all right, here's the reverse shoulder. We get the only way you practice it because your defensive guys won't let you practice it. You can't do it in, in scrimmages. You got to do it in games. So the only way you practice it is with this bag. All right, you want to make sure you have the forearm and the elbow just nick the front of the bag like that. Take a quick step on the ground. Don't step underneath yourself. Step right there. Get that front of the ground and reverse. And you just land like boom. Cut on, cut on timber. We don't cut on. Boom. Snap your feet. This way. Boom. Lead quick step on the ground. The reason that steps there is you don't want to step underneath yourself. And if for some reason he does land inside, you don't fix. You forget about the reverse part. You just go, just go with an angle block again. Here is the wrong way to do it. That's what you got to avoid. They have a tendency to bring that foot underneath them. What happens there is you're not going to stop the penetration. You're a little bit slower on it. Here it is right here. Boom, tall timber. 
Just get him here. No penetration. He's a reader and he's coming across. Get him down the ground. Lead step. Quick step. Get him on the ground. Shoulder. Boom. Over the leg. That's perfect. If, if anything, yeah, he gets back up, may make the play, but you made him get down on the ground and have to get back up. They hate to get up and down off the ground. Wear him down after the game. Mix it up on him so he doesn't know it's not always an angle block on him. Use a change up. It also helps if he can get this guy down. It may help your center reaching that shade of nose. This kind of this is like domino effect. It gets my help to the center there. Boom, get him down. Here we go. Now right there, if he kept his feet, we might have won that game. That's a one key play that we didn't end up just getting a field goal there. Lost by a couple points. He just trips up there. We thought maybe that, that should, he should have broke that one. Again, reverse shoulder. He still has a problem. He's stepping underneath himself a little bit here. He's got to take that step boom. Reverse, I don't like, see he's kind of falling on his hip. Legs got to come around a little bit quicker. Uh, here's a guy, just you got him scrambling, even if he just puts his hands on the ground, you delayed him enough to get him out of the play. It's a good change up. You got to have guys that want to go down on the ground and do this. But I guarantee you, it's the only way I'm convinced that you can stop a penetrator or a clubber. It's a very short. All right, now, talk about it real quick. The power angle, now your tackle's blocking down, he's not pulling. Tyler knows that. Here's the power play. All right, versus this look, we're double teaming here. He's got a power angle. Take the angle you've got, stay with the leverage, and drive. Now you know what else is happening. This is off the power. Take, prevent penetration, and drive. Same thing up top. Usually you only get that A block in on this play is when you get this look. Sometimes you talk about like, sometimes you don't want the double team all the time. This is versus you talk about this here, we talk about that. Here's how we block it versus the not a whole look. We talked about that last night. One so one snap we had. We'll go ahead and knife here, centers by himself, rub here, tight ends by himself, and we come around there. That's my one look at it. I didn't have that tape with me last night. That's how we checked in the power versus the Navajo. I have double team. Slam. Remember, we practice it this way. This is for assignments only. Outside footwork. Coming off. Really, we want to get movement. I'm just trying to get the position. We want these guys out of movement. It gets you off the ball. Then maybe somebody run through. Basically, outside footwork with it and get the movement off the ball. I don't like using against bags. I'd rather do it against this look here. Here's inside footwork, though. Working it, boom, and trying to work the guy off the ball. Here it is right here. Now, this is what I'd like to see. This guy's feet are off the ground. That's some explosion there. His feet are off the ground. That's a good initial part of what we're talking about double. He is off the goddamn ground going straight back. Scrap feet, stop it. All right. Here he decided to use inside footwork because he said, hey, he's a little tight. He may work it. Boom. Knock him off the ball. Now, Scrafford probably figured that this guy was smack. His head's buried in there. Probably don't like that a lot. But you can see he worked with his collision. He worked his head to get back up. And again, on this play, guys, you see, we take a shot with this guy up here and don't worry about this guy. Because we have enough stuff with Steve Young coming up and keepers that that guy's going to be there. He ends up chasing. Next time we run it, we go ahead and run keep it. We're out. All right, here's again. Inside footwork. Taking the guy off the ball, I believe. Because he's in tight. Drive him straight back. Tight end. Don't be in a hurry. Stay on, stay on. Make the guy come over the top. All right, now working on run throughs. I'm going to do it on time, though. But again. That's, uh... 15 minutes. Shit. All right. Wide guy, we talked about this last night. 
Give a shot in that scrap, here comes a run through, coming off. Eyes are inside, work with the outside foot. Tight end knows he's going to stay on this guy for a long time. He's going to lose his tackle. When you see the wide technique, you know you're going to lose the tackle. This is a new guy here, Jamie Brown, that we got from Denver. Big, tall, long legged guy. Now we got the mic coming through. Happens in the game, right here, against Philadelphia. <laughs> Probably see it better from the end zone. Outside footwork, eyes in the gap, push them straight back, tackle them off. Again, if you didn't have the tight end there, put the crawler pad right there, boom, work that trophy, comes off with exactly what you have right there. Exact same technique. Flipper, here's a flipper, <clears throat> flipper, get him off, come off inside, away you go. Same thing here. Linebacker running underneath with outside footwork. Yeah. Now we're talking about guys slamming inside. Tight end coming off of the backside. Outside footwork with this slam and a guy cross shades. It happens. Do the best job you can to happen coming in him. This is where you probably prefer to step on the inside foot. But you already made a turn when he's wide. Boom, be a good athlete to stay with it. Tight end, next thing he comes towards you. Take it. Outside footwork, guy slants. Tight end sees him disappear. There's a mic, not to love. Leave him for the guard. We come up to shoot. Outside footwork, slant. Linebacker's just kind of flowing off. Don't waste yourself in there. Try to get back to here if you can. <laughs> Again, when this guy's cheated here, we'll go ahead and we were trying to get the center up in there. We always try to get somebody on there rather than the double team. I think the best thing Bob McKinney does, he schemes and tries to do, let's try to, maybe he get there, maybe we can chop and lure, get the center up in there so that you can spend a little bit more time on the double team and you can try to get to the grip. Don't worry about this end all the time. Again, now here's inside footwork. I get to the end zone. Head up, obviously you gotta go inside footwork here. Boom, don't go block that guy tight end, wait for the second guy. Bring it right up in the shoot. All right, and again, here's the last look. With the tight end here, hanging on his tackle, kind of screws him, he's high, but boom. Take a shot and throw on somebody once in a while. The guy's burying himself there. He's, he, we've been double teaming most of this game, so he said, screw it. I'm going to grab grass. Tight ends a little bit lower now. Wait, wait, wait. Go ahead. Cut the guy down. All right. Again, here's how we kind of work the slip. Work it, driving off, getting the flipper. Again, work he's Now he's a little, still like that, a little bit lower. Again, see, I've loaded up the bag with this, put a little bit more weight on it. Because the thing was slipping, it was going so fast that day. Work it here. Outside hand's got to try to be free. Don't want to turn in. Working to slip against the defense. I'm going kind of fast, you guys, because I'm short on time. This is what happens when you don't deliver a blow. This is a dome run. You get, boom, get jacked. One and another better blow than Okay. This is what you don't want to do is take one step and then cross over or avoid it. Tight ends like the void and the lead end likes the void and leave that little gray area there. The second step's the most important. It's got to be an outside footwork and up through. That's why I like to work that goddamn car that you take a step and you make sure that second step comes through. When you go against bags and you go against air, there's just a tendency not to con continue through with that second step up through the field. So you got to do it either live to get it on film or do it against the crowd. When you go against bags, it ends up being just kind of rounded off too much, and it, you, you get this, this, get this action right here. They, they try to peek for the guy coming over the top. You don't want that to happen. I, sometimes this happens here when a guy just slants and doesn't do anything. You kind of like to keep that hand free, but you know it just attracts him sometimes. But do the best you can to stay square and just come off the tackle and pick that guy up. Like happened like right here. 
If you see, most of our stuff is, you know, if I get time to get some of the running plays, most of our stuff is pinch the defense inside before you run an outside play. Rather than stretch it or toss it, it's draw the defense tight, then bounce it. All right? Two theories of it. A lot of people just like to run the stretch play, hand out, stretch the defense initially, then cut back. The whole theory of a lot of our stuff, either in one back or two, is draw them in tight and then have the ability to bounce. And that's basically, that's our philosophy. You can have it, either one's good. I've been in toss, you know, basic pitch against USC. You know, I've been with a stretch team when I was at Michigan State. This theory now is throw them in tight to get your stretch outside. Or, like I said, the other theory is stretch them now and cut them back. It's what you believe in and what your back father the best at. This way, I guess there's, you know, you get the seams, you know, you cut it back inside there. All right, here's the nine technique, we can work here. Now you work here hard, there is the, he's trying to work the flipper. Remember, you may lose your tackle all the time. All right, so you gotta think about that in all the way. Work the same thing here, with a run through. Still, he can always, outside footwork, second step up. That guy's not bad, he's been trained, he's got a guy, that's how he's working here with bag. Other than the footwork and assignments, I think that goes wasted. Here it is out of the top here. Downhill, we're slipping and bouncing. Seven technique, outside footwork. Knows his tackles there. Tackles good job with his eyes on the run through. Nice job with the run by Scrapper. Boom! Knock him down. There's all inside. Alright, once in a while we like to work outside footwork, up into it, and throw. Now, I prefer when we throw to make, I don't want to land on the shoulder. Get you, I don't want to see grass stains on your front. When you throw, I want to see it. Dive out and get grass stains up front. Don't want you to roll over to protect yourself. The only guy, I got little shirt support girls, the guys right there. But I'd rather see, boom. I want you to fly right like that. Extend yourself. This little bag, you just, I want it. And I want that cut just right there, boom, fling it out. Get them to get their ass on the ground. Here it is up here. Just a change up. He sees it on film, he says, oh damn, I gotta worry about that. Ass over teacup. Now we couldn't reach the three here, but again, the technique said there's the flipper, outside footwork, flip. Boom, jack him, boom, cut his ass down. There's a wide line. You know, this play will kill you, you see this? All right, here's like a first running play against Green Bay. All right, we slipped it, we got him stretched. Garrison's been out for five, five, six, seven games with his collarbones in Kansas City, and he missed this. He, he normally would hit that and take that thing right there. In other words, he followed Floyd, and there's Reggie. You say nine techniques always been working back outside, he did. We ended up stretching out. But there's the idea of, with a nine, most likely the tackle's gonna feel, hand out, boom, Make a contact and drive through. <coughs> While I'm here, keep the lights down. I'll, I'll, while I'm here, I'll talk about. Oh, the, oh okay. Well, then I'll come back to this. I still have time. Huh? I still have time. Still time? Okay. Good. Let me go. Uh, <coughs> I'll get the one plate down and go over five minutes and that should be good. So, Charlotte, sure we'll have to stay. Number all the fronts. You know, in the old days, that was just the five kilo. Well, it's a 34, 25, you thought it was always an under. Basically, to go real quick, you can ask about me later, but if it's a strong reduction, it's a fifth something in the 50s, it's a weak reduction, it's in the 20s, and after that, if it's any 40 defense, it's a 49 or 59 based on what you were looking at. 
But the system, that's a system that Bob has had to learn. So you're going to be placed, you got to learn all this stuff. So on handoff solid, basically, we're in the eye. All right? And the combination, remember, the fullback wants to go downhill, and then he just kind of, you know, he just redirect flashes himself. He basically is going to come up on force. Right? But he starts at making it looking like an ISO. Right? And then he just kind of bends and flares and works his path to the strong safety, to the force, but he always will help out if something shows. Tailback comes straight downhill, grabs the ball, dips, and it's just what we, I think, a lot of people clinic have talked about. So it's essentially a box play from the eye, rather than one back. Steelers do it a ton, and a lot of people do it. Basically, that's what you do. And so it's looking like ISO. It freezes those linebackers, it freezes the defense, we're coming at you. Now, you should be able, whether you should now run this ISO, and you're regular, just run a straight lead, and your offense, or, you know, you kind of waste your time, but just figure that's how you run. We run a lead draw, and we run the ISO. It's the same theory of back, it's, it hasn't changed when I was at USC. If they're stopping the blast, you should run the pitch. If they're stopping the pitch, you should be running the blast. Same theory here. If they're running ISO and they're squeezing it, hey, chance to get this bounce play in there. If they're trying to get too wide and they're stopping your bounce play, run the ISO out. And I guarantee you, and Tom LeBot talked about last night, this guy has got to be, he's a man. Your fullback's got to be a block. If he doesn't have any courage, you're going to be in deep trouble. So versus the 34, you can do any combination here. It's a reach, it's a reach. Now what happens inside here, we talked about last night, it can be a zone concept there, it can be a man, you can pull there. We game plan it, game by game, what we think the best way to do it is. So what I'm saying is you can zone it here, or you can go ahead and F him around, right, based on what you want to do, or if he thinks he can make it through there, go ahead and take a shot. Because it looks like ISO. You think you'd make it, don't worry about the zone, just go ahead and take it. But we've done all three. Basic more than not, like we just if the guy around, just like a, just like a horn pull for that back. Backside is the basic backside blocking where we're going on and we're cutting and we're cutting there. Backside tackle will go rip through and he'll try to go get plugger and cut him. If he get a shot, he loves he's gonna float. But it's always our backside scheme. He'll cut that in. If he feels pressure, he'll cut him because you'll see sometimes that play has come behind the nose, if you can believe it. It happened against true 34 teams, that play can come behind the nose. But again, it's coming down, he's supposed to bounce it, but they stretch so far, they'll hit it right up the shoot. 25, same thing here, we're just reaching there, we're slipping, but we're cutting out. Last night we are talking about going sideways. The way it's taught, Rob is going to teach it, it is cutting. He's going to cut the end, the guard's going to go and cut the guy. They're going lateral, but they're cutting, right? not staying up on it. They want to cut these guys down. Same kind of, these three guys are exactly what the same thing is up there on the 34. Whatever your game plan. Remember, you also can do that if you wanted to. If we're doing that, this guy automatically, you know, is on a if, on a if mode, meaning he's through around for the back. When you get the over, the 57, usually we can do two ways. You can go down, down, pull around, him up there, again, we can be out of, we can be in strong. That way, backside here, go ahead and clip, cut him down on the backside. Again, it's down and bounce around. Also versus that look, you saw on the film, if you felt you could do it, you could go ahead and slip and zone it. The whole key is, can your tackle drive or reach the three technique? You feel comfortable with that. If not, you a block it. Lock down. 43. Anything you want to do here, we'll go ahead and slip it down here. Any combination you want there, go ahead and reach it, and it's downhill and away you go. If you couldn't reach this guy and you felt like pulling him, you do it. Most likely there, we'll just go ahead and slip it. 51 adjusted. All right. Basically, one that we may go ahead and go down, down, kick out, downhill around. All right. Go ahead and slip it there. We call that A block. That's kind of, you see, we got looks kind of like a G scheme. If this guy gets too wide, but that's still go ahead, that'll be the kick out. That's the one you saw. We come around, the fullback actually can block. We'll call it lead. <clears throat> then after they lead, maybe we'll put the fullback, if you think that guy's too wide, and guard will turn his ass up. We switch it around on the fourth. We're going fast out here, but I'll talk to you a little bit later about it. 
And against here, which is there, we're down. <coughs> He'll go ahead and pull. Fullback is dipping, coming around. We try to take a shot there on that Mike and cut him. If he doesn't get him, again, as you know, guards him off a buck. As you know, the fullback is always there for cleaner. And that's the beauty of the thing is if someone screws up in front or something can't get anybody, the guard will be there for cleaner. Okay, let me get the phone. <coughs> Sifting on the back side, take the most dangerous, reaching, guy comes back door, nose run, look, we're coming down here, it's called 98, but that ball's coming all the way behind the nose. Different around, now you got a 25, got a reduction. Here's what I'm talking about, the cut. Reach, they're going to go ahead and slip, boom, down, down, down. They, that creates the hole up there. Don't want to stay up. Get this guy down, get the nose running, nothing there, boom, take it. Coach, if that nose was tilted, you're having a hard time with the center reach him with the down ball action in the backfield. What would you do? Still go ahead and drive it. All right, still go. If it gets a little bit wider, you, you, know, you, you kind of still want to get the guard. You, you may help. The least thing we do is want to help the guard there. Go ahead and just take a stretch. If it gets too wide, all right, and he gets way in here, we're on the same exact play to the weak side. 99 handoff way, because he gets too wide and he can't get the flat out. We'll go ahead and check it and go back the other way. All right, we're on the same play going weak, and all it is is that fullback now will take that guy, and then we'll go big on big on that side. Okay? That's what you're saying. If this guy starts getting real heavy here and he can't drive him flat, we'll go ahead and take it the other way. Or do we want to go block down, block down, and then turn it like a G ski? Here's a different look. Now we'll go ahead and we'll block down. Here's a tight end outside here. Down, down, guard around. All right. Here's the switch up. The way we did this one here, you say, well, you know, we'll come up through the force here. That's a backer out there. So the guard's going out to the backer. Guard has force. He's sitting right there. That's like a, a stuff we call it. They're switching them out. All right. Down. See him coming up there, that's a, that's a fullback man. Guard searches out wherever that linebacker is, he's outside wide. Go get him, boom. Go and try to throw there and cut. Here's the situation, we like there for that guard to throw and knock that guy down. I can see the drill here in a little minute, in a minute. 49 front, take a look here. There's your cut block. Calls A block. Down, down. Guards around. He's on him. This is a situation you can get it. Cut, cut. Take that angle and get him and throw. Boom. Same thing down here. Good shot in the center. Taking that mic. Up through. Again, coming down the hill, and just the tight end got a hold up on that end on that. Because again, say 20, you know, look up here on top, like 25. See the center, if, if the guy runs here, you talk about if we can get the center to run. 
it comes back behind him. You know, your question is, you know, w, if, if he's even wider, if we think that as long as this guy can get this guy flat now, we think we're still okay, because we believe we're gonna be good on that backside cut. Coach, really technical cool tackle was kicking out that bubble. Right here? Yeah. Yeah. He is gonna try to, he knows that guy's gonna stretch, right? So he pulls deep, he's gonna run until that guy wants to run. If he, he collapses inside, we'll go ahead and log him. If he's just going to sit and run, you just keep on running with him and just stretch him, stretch him, just keep on stretching him. He stretches as long as you are. He just becomes like the tight end if he was going to reach him. Right? If you don't try to think kick out unless the guy kicks himself out just naturally. Right? If he wants to step down with a tight end, then obviously we'll try to log and go ahead and cut him. Again, here it is again, going behind and over. What's to the back reading on that? What's still? Right here. Basically, when he he's coming downhill, he wants to, he takes the ball here and he just looks. He wants to just come downhill. If he happens to see a hole, we tell him go ahead and take it. If it looks like we've got room outside, but he does, he looks coming down here. He's just looking right at the tackle's block. If the, if it's a B block, he might be looking right here. But if we give him freedom, if he sees something free backside, go ahead and take it. But basically, if we watch it, if it's a I, uh, over front, he's reading the tight end's block. Right? Coming down right to the outside leg of the tackle. <clears throat> now, if you run this back open, you're giving up the block and safety then? If you block what way? If you ran back weak open, you'd be giving up the block on the safety. Yeah, we tried to get something happen over there. Yeah, with the weak may run out of slot, we would give up the safety. Yes, correct. Right. <clears throat> but usually, it's just looking to be here, here, full back up on him, and he bounced it anywhere he wouldn't take it that way. If there's a guy coming up here with that fourth, if we try to get him there, if not, we probably motion across and try to get somebody over on us. Here's a look at the beat block again. We saw this on my the other tape. See, when you talk about the tackle, he just keeps on staying and reaching the guy. We've got a question there, just keep running with him. Just stay with him, stay with him, just run. And there's the idea of, you know, we're we're sorry we missed this guy, because this guy was good at just kind of getting a feel, give a little chip, go get somebody else. Which one of the nose was G'd all the way over? What did you guys do that? Like over here, this nose here? Yeah, close. On this look here. On a 60 defense, or eagle defense. I'm trying to convince you. Like Rick? Eagle G. What? Like an eagle G? Probably go back the other way. Back the other way. See, I apologize, guys. I'm on all these numbers now, so I, I haven't gone back my own eagle over and under. Yeah. <laughs> and here's what we saw here. We saw this on the film. All right. I, I want to show you the one going weak. I don't think I got that. The way we practice, you can, our defense won't let us do it, but we're practicing the cut button with these kind of these stand up dummies. This is what we saw right here, we back up there a little bit. Between guard and center. Practice and cut. Tougher guy, they don't want to do that a lot. Look at the game just again. Different plays out wide where you cut. 98 H is just the same kind of play. This is where the fullback now is on the linebacker and guards on force. Different play than the handoff solid one. The handoff solid one is one of our better play. This is the old classic flat back one. Here's your reverse boom, cutting them down. Here's your center going for the cut. And your guard pulling out an edge, 
and throw it. He hates doing this, go to the ball down the ground like that. <clears throat> Again, practicing the play, you got your reverse shoulder, got your guards pulling, the guy on the edge, practice it and give him a look at the cup, getting them with the grass stick. Look, we saw this one already. Guy coming on the edge, the block, attacking, cutting. Whatever. 